Can I get an amen? Thank you all. That was awesome. That was really pitiful. Uh, try again. Just making sure y'all are awake and present. There we go. We want to welcome you to worship. I'm Steve Castile, senior pastor here at Heritage United Methodist. We want to welcome those of you online and thank you for joining us in this worship service. <clears throat> I want to take a minute and let you know that on every pew there should be a blue or a green uh, registration pad. It's our way of taking attendance and knowing who's here and taking good care of you. Please take time to pass that down, sign in. There are places there for you to put prayer requests, for you to request to join, for you to request a pastoral visit. It's just one of the ways we have to help care for you uh, and to celebrate that you're here with us today. So please uh, take time to do that. Today we start a series on stewardship uh, and I hope that you're eager about this. Uh, there's always some apprehension whenever we kind of pair worship with money. Uh, but what we want you to know is that stewardship is not just about money. It's about how we steward all the resources that God gives us in life. And we found a real cool resource. Uh, you've gotten your email, but out on the table in the narthex is a book called The Genius of Generosity. And it's going to be the book we're looking at uh, in a scriptural approach to stewardship. They're $5 each. And if you didn't bring your $5, we trust you just... Uh, take the book and, and bring us back the money later. But you will enjoy kind of reading through this. It gives you a new perspective on how to take all the giftedness that God gives us and to allow it to bring you not only the joy, but to put you in service to this world. So make sure you do that. We start Wednesday night back. Hub Life is back in swing uh, this week with meal and with all the lessons, uh, with all the classes. So we welcome you back. The last two times we had Hub Life, we had over 100 and uh, the first week over 125, the second week over 140. So come and get a good meal and be a part of fellowship. And at the risk of us, some of us losing in class, one of the gifts of Hub Life is kind of what we used to call the Soul Food Cafe. Some of you may not want to go to class, but we, you can just sit at the tables and talk to each other. Um, and, and in this day of isolation, that's a pretty cool gift uh, to be able to be together in fellowship. And we don't write your name down for being derelict and going to classes. We won't, we won't keep total of that. It's just an opportunity for fellowship and a time to be together. So if you haven't been, come. If you're our first time guest, you get to eat free. Uh, no line. We're in church, but uh, it is good and it's a wonderful family meal. On the screen, you've been seeing the Collinsworth concert is coming October 15th. George is selling tickets. We have sold out, I think, the artist circle to that, and we're looking for a, a full house. If you haven't heard them, you ought to buy the tickets. It's probably the fa my favorite concert we do in the series, so see George about that. Uh, Sam is beginning a women's Bible study Thursday, October 21st at 9 o'clock in the hospitality room. So if you're interested, contact her, and uh, everyone's invited uh, to be a part of that fellowship. Several of you were asking for an opportunity for Scripture Bible study. We've missed our Thursday Bible study, so many of us have. So come and be a part of that. October 22nd, the next day, we're having a marriage event. Uh, many of the men participated in the men's event. Right now, media does a marriage seminar. If you show up, it doesn't mean you're having trouble. It means you're trying not to have trouble. So uh, come, it's not, nobody's going to take names because you came to the marriage seminar and think that there was something wrong. It's a wonderful time to uh, celebrate marriage and to look at ways in strengthening your relationship. Finally, uh, Wednesday, October 27th, in lieu of our regular Hub Life, we'll have um, trick or, trunk or treat um, and the chili cook-off. And so we invite you, if you've never been a part of the chili cook-off, um, 
then you need to be a part of that. And, and I will stand up for myself. Last week, John uh, insinuated that I bought a championship, uh, which I did, but he also criticized my chili, which Cindy made. So that's, he's in double trouble, and y'all just pray for him for that because... Uh, it just wasn't right. But it's a lot of fun. Uh, you come and, and take part and, and enjoy the fellowship. And you can come and bring your own car, decorate it up. And it's, ju it's just a cool evening of fellowship there. I'm going to ask you, if you will, to join me as we uh, share together in our responsive reading, which will be on the screen. Uh, and this will be through the whole series of the Genius of Generosity. Almighty God, keep Christ Lord of our lives. Help us see the world as you see it and help us stay true to your mission. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, as we come on this beautiful morning, we are reminded of the genius of your creation. Out of everything, you spoke reality. And then you entrusted your creation to our care. And you called us to entrust our lives to your care. Help us to order our lives and our decisions so that we will be found faithful in our stewardship, not only of ourselves, but of this glorious world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As we join in song and worship, if you'll stand, we're going to sing together, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. If you want to use the hymnal, it's number 133, or the words are on the screen. If you'll remain standing, then let's join together as we affirm our faith with the Apostles' Creed. Let's join together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
may be seated. As we come to our time of offering, we remind you that uh, your financial gifts help us be in ministry and that your generosity allows us to serve in so many ways. And so we remind, even if you're watching online, that there are ways for you to give electronically. Uh, and for those of you who are used to paying your bills online, you can do that here. I know when some people hear that, it kind of rubs them the wrong way. It almost sounds like a commercial. But it's just an opportunity for you to give diligently, whether you're present or not. And so we thank you for your generosity. There's no ministry that happens without you being generous. So we're going to ask the ushers to move among you and take the offering at this time. seated. I saw many of you ha having your hands ready to clap, but not clapping. So we want to thank Wes and Marsha. And of course, I'd like to thank Harry. He's my husband. So I have to ask you to clap for him. Um, 
But we, we do appreciate um, Wes and Marsha and all of the work that they do to, to make our services meaningful. So as we come to our prayer time today, I just want to draw your mind to a few things. Um, Jeff just came up and told us a last minute prayer request that Harrison McLean, he is the son of Dr. McLean, was killed in a car accident last night. Um, so we want to especially keep that family in your prayers. I believe that Harrison was a high school student. Is that correct? Yeah, Harrison was in high school. Um, so we just want to pray that um, God would wrap his hands around that family because this isn't going to be an easy thing. Um, I also just want to bring your attention to stewardship season. And Steve mentioned that a little bit earlier. Um, but I would encourage you for the next month to start praying about what God is calling you to in, in stewardship and in that realm. Is there something that um, he's calling you to with your gifts and graces, or is it the next step financially, or what might that be? Because stewardship is about so much more than just your finances. So let's have a time of silent prayer, and then I'll bring us together, and then we will finish with the Lord's Prayer. So let's pray. Father God, we are thankful to be in your house this morning. Lord, we're thankful to be surrounded by those that we love, by our church family and by our children and by our grandparents and aunts and uncles, Lord, and um, our brothers and sisters in Christ, Lord. Today, we want to lift up the McLean family. Lord, I can't even begin to imagine what that mom and dad are experiencing this morning, Lord. But I pray that you would raise up a community around them that is going to surround them and love them through this. And Lord, that you would bring them peace and comfort in a way that only you can. And Lord, I pray that during this time of stewardship, Lord, that we would examine our hearts, that we would examine the ways that we're using our gifts and graces, the ways that we aren't, um, the ways that we are stingy with our finances or with our time or with our talents, Lord, that we would be convicted of that and that we would change. Father, we thank you so much for all that you're doing in our community and in the life of Heritage Church, and I pray that you would continue to lead us well and that we would follow you, Father. And it's in your name that we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you were here last week, then you saw one of our missionaries that we support, Allie Mellon. She came and talked about the work that she did. And I said that that is one of my favorite parts of my job, is getting to stay in touch with the missionaries that we support. And this week, we have another set of missionaries who are very familiar to you here at Heritage. Um, we have Grayson and Rachel Luther. Grayson actually grew up here at Heritage, and so he is a very familiar face. Um, they served in India for several years, and now they're back stateside serving in Georgia. So I'm going to invite Grayson to come and just share a little bit about what's going on with them. Thanks. It's good to be here with you guys this morning. It's been a really, really long time. Um, so it's good to see all of your faces in real life. Um, I'm sure you guys have been thinking that too, like as you come, come back together um, in person. And it's, it's good to see one another's real faces. Um, yeah, so like, like Sam was saying, we um, moved back from India um, on the, I, just on the way over here um, on Rachel's phone. It had like the, you know, like memory from two years ago today. We were fly, we, like there were pictures of us in the airport flying back, like arriving in the U.S. two years ago today. So happy anniversary to us. Um, we're Americans. Um, so we're still working with Global Frontier Missions, the organization that we were overseas with, um, and now my role is 
focused on mobilizing and equipping churches to get involved with missions. Um, I get to the privilege of kind of coming alongside people within churches groups or people that are passionate about it and want to see more people in their church get involved with what God's doing in the nations. And so I kind of coach them and give them resources um, to do that. Um, so a lot of times churches are good at um, kind of encouraging people to leave and go and do missions and kind of help them out with some money and give them a high five and say, good luck. Um, but uh, I think that it's really important for us to, as the kind of the little C churches, but also as the big C church to like um, be a part of not just like giving people a high five and like sending them out, but like being a part, like an invested part of the work. Um, that people are doing overseas. The, the like the Great Commission did not say send somebody to go and and make disciples of all nations. It just says go to all of us to go and make disciples of all nations. And so we all have kind of a part to play in that. Um, and sometimes we can kind of think of um, the people that we send out as our part. Um, but we all have parts to play. And um, so we really champion praying and sending and welcoming. Um, Going, sometimes we think of going as like getting on an airplane and going somewhere to another country, but going just really means like getting out of your comfort zone, leaving your little world bubble, um, and, and going out and intersecting with somebody else's worldview, going, getting into somebody else's way of doing life and um, bringing Jesus with you. Um, another thing that we ask people to do is, is welcome, be a welcomer. Um, welcome others into the way that you do life. Um, invite international students or um, people that believe other things that are in your communities or neighbors. Um, invite them into the way that you do life so that they can see and, and know God in that way. Um, one, a few of the things that we do there um, as a part of my job um, is a short, short term trips. So people come to Clarkston to kind of see what it looks like to uh, hang out with internationals. It's a super diverse area where we live. There's, I think, 40 different nations that are represented within our, our little small community. Um, and so people come and visit and we share about God. We go through the Bible and talk about like, this is really is God's heart from you know, Genesis to Revelation is that all the people of the earth would know about him and worship him. Um, we also have this Bible study um, that we put out that I try and get as many people as I can to go through. Um, that's five weeks of just kind of talking about our purpose in God's heart for the nations. Um, like why, like why does God care so much about the nations and what do we, what role do we, each of us, all of us have to play in that? Um, and then also we um, encourage people to I kind of coach people through doing an event in their community where they um, kind of get out into their area and find international people um, and see that there are actually lots of, even in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, there are lots of international people that you can um, get in, get to know. Um, you don't have to fly to India. You don't have to fly to um, some uh, difficult to enter country. Um, you can just go up the road and, and go in the grocery store or um, hang out at a park and, and meet people that are from those places that you have access to here um, and talk to them about Jesus. Um, so that's, that's kind of what, what we're doing these days, and it is really fun. It's such a privilege, I feel like, to get to um, mobilize and get more people excited about what I feel like is such a huge part of God's heart that we, we leave out a lot of times. Um, I would love to invite you guys, uh, Rachel and I are planning that after church today to go and eat some Indian food um, at Turtle Creek Mall. There's an Indian restaurant there. And as many of you as would like to come, I would love to hang out and have a meal with you. Um, so if anybody's interested, that's where we're going. Um, let me know and, and we'll all go together. Um, it's good to see you guys and thank you for being a part of my life and encouragement and um, yeah, part of our, our journey through this stuff. Um, so thank you guys.
Um, we are so proud of the work that Grayson and Rachel are doing and um, asked them where the kids are today, but they left the three of them behind in Madison. So um, I'm thankful for them to get a little time away from their kids. But we always love having Grayson and Rachel here. And so if you're interested in learning more about what they do or who they serve um, or how to support them financially or through prayer, they would love to talk with you guys after the service. Um, or you can talk to me or Scott, and we can give you more information on that. So as we move further into our service, I want to invite you to stand for our song of consecration. Good morning. I think this is on. Our scripture lesson for today comes from Matthew 6, 19 through 24, from the New International Version. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are, not hel are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. This is the word of God for the people of God. Why is it genius to be generous? God blesses generous people because generous people are forced to take risks and trust him and believe his word. It's not an act. It's not something that you do. Generosity is the way that you live when the spirit of the living God inside of you is given the freedom to express his love and generosity and focus toward others. How generous are you? It's not every day that I get an, a sermon intro by Chip Ingram, so that was pretty cool. Um, but if you have, if I have not had a chance to meet you yet, my name is Sam, and I'm one of our associate pastors here, and I work primarily with our mission and outreach and young adults and college students, but I also get to preach and lead Bible studies and do fun things like that. So. Today, we're going to kick off our annual stewardship campaign, and we're starting a new series today called The Genius of Generosity, and there are these cute little bright and shiny yellow books that are out there on the narthex if you would like to pick one up. 
So I'm going to follow pretty closely to chapter one of that book today, and I can't speak for Steve and Scott and John and what they'll do for the next couple of weeks, but um, today is just an intro to this book and to what we're going to be talking about for the next few weeks. So in this series, you're not going to hear lots of oughts and shoulds and guilts and how you just need to love God more and more and all will be well. That's, that's not what this book is about. What you will hear is what the word of God teaches about the genius of generosity. So the theme of this teaching is going to be similar to what Jim Elliott said in response to the story of this man who sold all he had to purchase the field that contained great treasure. Jim said, he is no fool to give what he cannot gain, to keep what he cannot lose. That's kind of a complicated quote that I had to read a few times. So if you haven't read the book yet, the quote is in there and you can examine it more for yourself. But we're going to start our study today by defining just a couple of terms. And I was surprised when I learned the actual definitions of these words. So of genius and generosity. So let's look at genius first. In our popular usage of genius, it's a person with a really high IQ. You know, that's what we think of when we hear the word genius. But in reality, it means something really different. It has to do with producing and with quality and with natural ability. In other words, a genius is a smart person, but they're not necessarily one with an exceptional high IQ. So so we'll talk about the smarts and the wisdom of generosity, how anyone can be generous and anyone can be a genius when it comes to generosity. Now to look at generosity. So in Hebrew, generous means to saturate with water, to give to overflowing, to drink one's fill. So because water was a primary source of life in this time, to give generously was to bring to life. You can't live without water. So generous is talking about giving you water, drinking to your fill. That's that's literally giving life. So to be generous is to bring life. And in Greek, the word literally means ready to distribute. So it has to do with availability and where things and time and talent and treasure are at your fingertips. They're just ready to be given away to the right person at the right time to be a blessing to them. So today I would like to ask and answer the question, what's so genius about generosity? I want to give you four reasons why being generous isn't necessarily a high, noble, sacrificial, martyrdom-like kind of life that only a few super spiritual people can live up to. That's not what generosity is. So one of the hallmarks of of what I learned in college at my time, during my time at the Wesley Foundation, our campus minister kind of ingrained this thought into us that if you, once you leave the Wesley Foundation and you start making money, it is your responsibility to give back to the church. It is, it is a part of who you are as believers to tithe. And so Harry and I, we met at the Wesley Foundation and we both kind of grew up with, or grew up in college with the same kind of teaching. And so when we got married, right off the bat, we made the decision that we are going to tithe, that's, that we're going to do it. It's going to happen. And so we've been married for four years and we didn't start at 10%, but we gradually got to 10% to where we tithe um, with our finances. And I think since we've done it from the very moment that we got married, we don't even notice it. We We don't know any different. And so all of that to say is you don't have to be super wealthy. We had just graduated college. We, we didn't have a lot of money. You don't have to be super wealthy or super spiritual or super, you know, um, the cream of the crop in the church world to be generous. Anyone can do it. And I want to tell you that when you are a generous person, both practically and spiritually, it is the smartest, most intellectually sound decision you'll ever make for life now and for life later. So let's look at our reasons why generosity is genius. The first reason is that generosity is genius because it changes our lives. 
Generosity changes our lives. It's, if you think about it, generosity is the ultimate win-win proposition. People who, feel, who give, they feel great and they're blessed in return. And the people who receive feel good and are also blessed in return. So it's a win-win situation. And it's just a smart way to live. So scripture supports that generosity works. It's, it's not something that is just this crazy idea. Generosity works. Proverbs 11.25 says, A generous man will prosper. And the word prosper literally means that he'll be fat. A man will prosper. He will be fat. So it's the idea that life, his life will be one of abundance. You'll have enough. You won't go hungry. Not just materially. A generous man will prosper, and he who refreshes or waters others will himself be refreshed. God word, God's word tells us that if we live wisely in a way that pleases God, living as generous men and women, that we will prosper because he who refreshes or waters others will himself be refreshed. And think about this. So when people act greedy or selfish or Scrooge-like or they're miserable, unhappy people, or sorry, I said that wrong. When people are greedy and they're miserable and all of that, don't they said it wrong again, y'all. This is pregnancy brain. I'm going to use my get out of jail free card. I can't think correctly with this baby. I'm going to try this one more time. When people act in a greedy, selfish, or Scrooge-like way, they are miserable. There we go. That's what I was saying. They're miserable, unhappy people because they're, they're living in a way that's all about them, that it's greedy, that it's selfish. So how many of you can think of someone like that right now? I bet we all could, of someone who's just unhappy because they're so stingy and selfish. And these people, they're not only selfish and greedy, but... They're miserable. It sucks all the life out of them. So many times, controversy over money enters the picture, and lifelong relationships go down the tubes. And people end up getting depressed and angry and bitter. So why is that? It's because whenever we act selfish and greedy, we destroy ourselves and we destroy others. How many times have you seen on the news about someone who wins the lottery and then a few months or a few years or not even that long ago, their lives are ruined? Because it's not because they received a lot of money. That's not what happened with them. It's because of what the money did to them and what other people wanted from them. So all this to say that, that money changes people and it changes our lives, but generosity changes our lives for the better. So then the second reason that generosity is so, gen it's so genius is that it connects us with others. Generosity connects us with other people. So when people act generously and when they're gracious and when they're giving and when they're kind and when they help others and when they're, they're winsome, they're attractive. I'm, I look out at this congregation and I see the people who have been so generous to me and they're they're attractive, and I want to hang out with them, and I want to be friends with them. So it's kind of the opposite of what we talked about later or earlier. You know, when you're, when you're stingy and you're greedy, you're miserable. But when you're generous and you give to others graciously, you're happy, and people are drawn to you. They exude love and happiness, and we want to be around them. So strictly from observation and just from watching people around me, I can see that being generous is one of the smartest things you'll ever do. So if you want the quality of your life and the quality of your relationships to go up, be generous. How many of you feel encouraged or you feel positive when you do something generous? You get that feeling? And how many of you, when you know that someone has a need and you just jot them a note or you make a phone call or you drop by the hospital or you send them a meal, whatever you do, you know, it makes you feel good. And it makes you feel like you're doing something worthy of the gospel. And you are. And, sorry, I keep touching that. And how many of you, like me, have had times when you should have helped someone, but you talked yourself out of it? That that probably happens to a lot of us too. And then you get this little nagging feeling in the back of your mind and you're just, you can't shake it. And you realize 
that you were greedy and that you were selfish and you were focused on yourself. So see, your experience and my experience tell us that when we're generous, it's a good thing for me and it's a good thing for my friends. And it's a good thing for even the people that I don't know, but we're all positively impacted by generosity. So generosity is the most wise, win-win, practical way to live in this universe. The third reason that generosity is genius is that generosity helps us invest in what matters. Generosity protects us from short-sighted, bad investments of our time and our talent and our treasure. So every day you are making an investment and whatever you invest is, it always comes back with compound interest. So you're investing your time and your energy and your money and your thoughts and whatever you do, that's where your heart is and that's what you're investing in. So you're devoted to certain things, to certain people, to certain projects, to certain ministries and you're investing in them day after day after day and you can do it intentionally. And you can do it perf purposefully, and many of you do. I, I see that every day. Or you can just kind of waver around in life where you just get up and you just do stuff. Do you ever, have you ever been in a season of your life where you just don't feel like you have much purpose and you don't have much, much drive to do anything? It's the same thing with being generous. You can just kind of meander through life and say, oh, I'll give you know, some money here or there and see where that gets me. That's good. And I'm not saying you shouldn't do that. But what about when you live generously as a lifestyle and you have the places and the things that you're investing in, the things that are important to you, like I use Harry and I as an example. Again, we invest in the Wesley Foundation because that's where we met and that's a ministry that we believe in. We invest in service over self in Memphis because it made me who I am today. We invest in heritage because we love this church. So generosity invests or protects us from investing in things that are just short-sighted. And when you do just unpurposeful stuff, you're making some kind of investment. Every investment is going to have a return. And what we're going to learn from the very lips of Jesus in scripture is that if you wanted to be protected from bad investments, you need to become generous because sowing and reaping always occur in our lives. Whatever you sow today, you'll reap later, whether good or bad. So Jesus says, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. But you say, well, Sam, that sounds cool. You've made some good points. But how do I store up treasure in heaven? And there are multiple ways, but scripture gives us some really specific ones. First, we can financially give to the work of the gospel, where the word of God goes out and people's lives are changed, just like Grayson was just talking about. You can be a part of the gospel being spread to the kingdom from, you know, one place to the other by giving financially to missionaries like Grayson and Rachel or Allie or all of the others that we support. What we do know for sure about everyone is that when the word of God goes out and when it encounters people, their lives are changed forever. And we're going to greet everyone in heaven one day. Isn't that going to be cool when we walk up to someone and they say, you know, I heard the word of God because of that gift that you gave. Won't that, isn't that a cool thing to think about? The money that you're giving right now to advance the gospel could have lifelong salvation impacts on people. And so we give to the word of God being spread. A second way to store up treasure in heaven is we know that every act of kindness, even down to the degree of giving someone a cold cup of water in the name of Jesus, that has a promise attached to it. Even those little small acts of kindness. Jesus said that he would reward us in heaven. 
And finally, the scripture is very clear that when we help the poor, we are literally lending to the Lord. And not only will we get a reward now, but we're also going to get a reward in heaven. And finally, the fourth reason that generosity is genius is because generosity frees our hearts. So Jesus concludes his teaching about generosity with this timeless truth. He says, for where your treasure is, where your wealth and your property are, there your heart will be also. So generosity frees our hearts. Money, I had never heard this before, but I read this this week, that money is a mirror of our heart before God, which is kind of scary. But if you want to know where your relationship with God is at the clearest, most basic level, you don't have to look at how many times you attend church or you don't have to look at how many times you read your Bible or how long you pray. Those things are important. But Jesus said that the most accurate mirror of my heart is on my visa or my MasterCard statement or my checkbook ledger. When I look at where my money is going, I will know what I'm devoted to. And so Jesus says that in life there are two treasures. There are some that last forever and there are some that are temporal. And I either live for the now or I live for the things of God. And wherever my resources go, that's going to tell me what I'm living for. And when we understand what life is really about, that it's about relationships and joy and making an eternal impact by spreading the word of God and creating more believers, we reassess our investments and we place them in what is truly a treasure. So we evaluate all of our temporal possessions and arrange them in a way that maximizes the benefits for others. So I would pray that with as many people that there are in this room, and I know many of you, and I know that many of you are generous, that you'll be asking, you're probably asking yourself, how can I be more generous? How can I become the kind of person that I want to be? The kind of person that God says will prosper. The kind of person that God says he'll honor. The kind of person who will lay up treasure in heaven. And the kind of person that God can use to help so many people around the world. Because you see, generosity is a gateway to intimacy with God. We, it's kind of ironic. We get our greatest treasure by giving and by sharing rather than by hoarding and accumulating. You know, it's that saying that you, you give more, or you, I forgot the saying, scratch that. I was going to go somewhere else, but I went off script, and that's what happens when I go off script. So it's more of a blessing to give than receive. That's what I was going for. Um, so when we let go of the, of the temporary things in this life and when we quit focusing on ourselves and when we instead embrace these eternal treasures, then we get rich, y'all. We get rich in relationships and in our, in our love for God and in our love for neighbors. And here's what I don't want you to hear today. I've said a lot about how when, you, when we give, then we're going to be blessed. And when we give, we're going to be honored. But I don't want you to think that I'm up here preaching a prosperity gospel of when you're generous, then all good things are going to happen to you. And you're going to become materially wealthy because God is going to bless you. I'm, that's not what I'm saying today. But I am saying that generosity is biblical and it's what Jesus taught. And it really is a smart way to live. You will be blessed. You will be honored by being generous. And in truth, when we really stop and think about it, we don't have any time or we don't have any money or we don't have any possessions and we don't have any talent except what's been given to us. Everything that we have has been graciously and generously given to us by our Father in heaven. So it's not about owning. It's not about owning the things that we have, but it's about stewarding. It's about being a good manager, a good spiritual stockbroker. So how we invest our time and our talent and our treasure, we know that that's where our heart's headed to. So I'm going to ask you three questions to kind of close up today. And Chip Ingram calls these diagnostic questions to kind of help figure out where your heart is. 
So the first one is, where's my heart right now? If you pulled out your bank statement or your giving record or your credit cards or your, inv your investments, where does your money tell you that your heart is right now? That's the first question. And the second, to whom or to what do I want my heart most connected? Do I want it most connected to a certain person or to a beloved thing or to God or to some organization or to my children? What is it? What do you want your heart to be the most connected to? And then the third question, it teaches you how to get there. It says, what would be the smartest reallocation of my resources to move my heart where I want it to be? So the first question, where's my heart? The second question, where do I want it to be? And the third, what do I need to move around? Or what do I need to change? What do I need to reassess to get my heart where I want it to be? So would you like to be more generous? Or do you want to end your life in misery as a Scrooge and just kind of mope about life? Or would you like to end your life not only living the most intelligent, wise way for now, but also making this positive investment for your future? You're storing up treasures in heaven, preparing for eternity. So I pray that during the next three weeks, uh, or today and the next three weeks, as we continue looking at generosity, that you'll start seeing some things differently, that you'll start questioning maybe Maybe you are in a good place and maybe you're satisfied with where your generosity is right now. Um, but let's check that. Let's look into it and let's see if that's where we want to be. Let's take a moment and pray together. Father God, I thank you for today. I thank you for this congregation and for the generosity that is already present here, Lord. And I'm, I'm faithful. You are faithful. And I trust that in the coming months, Lord, we're going to see people become more generous, Lord, and more focused on making a kingdom impact. Father, we love you, and we praise you, and we thank you for today. Amen. I want to invite you now to stand for our closing hymn. Thank you guys for being here today, and thank you for joining in worship and for putting up with my, my crazy brain um, these days. I promise I'll be better after March. Um, and so um, I just want to invite you to pick up one of those books if you haven't already. And those three questions that I closed with at the end of figuring out where your heart is and where you want it to be and how to get there, they're in that book. So it's a really great resource. So as you leave today... I want to encourage you to look for ways to be more generous and to pray to God to be more generous and to really look at your heart and try to figure out where you're at. So y'all go in peace and have a great week. Amen.